Hi, hey everyone. Welcome to episode 274 of the All Dolphins podcast. It's Draft Day. Great Who movie. here likes the movie Draft Day? I love the movie Draft Day. Love yeah. it. Nope. Tony, you're a no? I've never watched it from start to finish. I refuse to watch it. I'm sorry. I, I live I live Draft Day 365 days a year, so I, I don't need to watch Kevin Cosner make a gazillion dollars and... Uh, you know, uh, kind of whatever. No, I've but never you watched. Know, realistic, Tony. You got to You got to get into it. You got to. You got to write a player on the name and say, uh, "What is it?" Did you say um, it's realistic, Vontae Mack. No matter what. Did you no, say Vontae Mack? No matter what. Yeah. Uh, Omar, and, the, the I, I, I had I had my fill with Jerry Maguire years ago. But dra draft day is fun. It, it's funny some of the some of the back and forth between Kevin Costner and the guy who plays the Seattle Seahawks general manager whose name escapes me, um, it, it's pretty priceless with the pancakes and your pancake eating, Meffer, uh, classic stuff. By the way, I think guess we should introduce Tony in the middle in case you don't already know who Tony is since we've been talking for five minutes. Tony Pauline, long time draft analyst, now working for Sportskeeda. Um, go way back with the dude. Omar goes way back with the dude. And we heard to talk draft, draft day. Miami Dolphins. Tony, how Tony you is the guy that I always come to for the news and the word on the street and the juice because he's connected with these teams and he, he knows what the rumors are. Tony, what, what's your sexiest rumor have you heard today on draft day? Um, a lot of things that I can't say. Oh, I reported earlier this morning that uh, Antonio Pierce is doing all he can to try and – I don't know if the word tank is too hard – but to keep Jaden Daniels for the commanders from selecting Jaden Daniels so somehow the Raiders can trade up to get him, it's not going to work. <laughs> nah, that's not going to work. No. And supposedly Jaden Daniels really wants to play for Antonio Pierce. Or Antonio Pierce really wants Jaden Daniels as his quarterback. That's what the situation is. I get the idea that Daniels – is very you know doesn't doesn't want to make waves. Will be happy playing with Washington. The people around him, and, and specifically Antonio Pierce, want to try and find a way that well, you know Washington passes on him. Washington trades the pick, uh, and that the Raiders can then get uh, have an opportunity to get Jaden Daniels. I don't. It, it's, well, number one, it's not going to happen. No. Number two, I don't think the the general manager, the brand new general manager, Tom Telesco, is on board with this. As I reported a while ago. Because the draft capital that would, the Raiders would have to give away to move up to get Jaden Daniels would be insane. And if you look at the history of those types of trades, Jared Goff, Carson R Wentz, R R Trey Lance, right, they never work out. Robert yeah. Griffin, they never work out when they give the team gives away three years worth of draft picks to move up and get the quarterback. I like Jaden Daniels. I happen to think he's going to be the best quarterback to come from this class. But still, when you give away an insurmountable amount of draft capital to get one player, you know, it, it rarely works out. This, and, and this he's, is where, he's hold, not. On, hold on, Omar. This is where I would point out that as catastrophically bad as the Dolphins' selection of Deion Jordan was in 2013, yeah. the fact that all they gave up to move up from 12 to 3 was a second-round pick, that is all they gave up, was actually brilliant from that standpoint. Oh, I, I have a great story with that. I, I remember sitting right between uh, Deion Jordan's family and the family of the offensive tackle from Oklahoma, who now plays with the Eagles, who name it names escapes. Lane Johnson. I'm sorry, Lane, Lane Johnson. Johnson. Lane Johnson, right? And when the Dolphins traded, I was there working for the Eagles at the time. And when the Dolphins made that move, Lane Johnson's family, everybody thought the pick was going to be Lane Johnson. And Lane, John and, and Lane Johnson's family was sitting in one section. Deion Jordan's family was sitting in the other section. And Lane Johnson's family, they were going crazy. They were jumping up and down. They were hugging each other. And Deion Jordan's family is looking at Lane Johnson's family like this. And every and then uh, was the, uh, was Goodell the, still the commissioner? Was it was it was Goodell? Right? It wasn't Tagliabue. He yeah, gets up yeah. there. Miami Dolphins with third pick of the draft take Deion Jordan, and it was. It was like an instant switch. It's like Lane Johnson, his family, it's like they let all the air out of the balloon <laughs> and the Jordan family are jumping up and down like they just won the lottery. I mean, it was insane. It worked out for the Eagles. Didn't work out for the Dolphins. For sure. Yeah. Um, let, let me ask you, Tony. Uh, 
regarding the Miami Dolphins and right. where they are at 21, right. do you feel that this is a draft where, you know, we talked to Chris Greer and Chris Greer said they're about 15, 16 legitimate first round picks in this draft. They feel confident that they're going to be in position to get one of those guys and be happy with where they are at 21. Now that could be just a pump fake to make teams say, Hey, you want 21, you better come get it. What, what do you think is going to be left there offensive line wise and defensive tackle wise and pass rusher? I'll throw that in there too. Yeah. Okay. I, defensive tackle. I mean, it's a matter of, do you think that Gerhard Newton of Illinois is worth the 21st pick of the draft? If you do, that's the only one there because Byron Murphy, who's the first defensive tackle is going to be long gone. I happen to like Newton. He does have the Jones fracture. I like his film the past two years. He's a guy when you watched him last year play, even when the, the outcome of the game was known and Illinois was going, it, it was not going to win the game, Newton was playing hard. I think he's undervalued. It's just a matter of do you think he's worth the 21st pick of the draft? Offensive tackles, a lot depends on what happens before that. If Bo Nix is selected, you know, before the 21st pick of the draft, you're going to get more better offensive tackles that fall down to the uh, to the Dolphins. If Michael Penix is selected before the 21st pick of the draft, which I believe is going to happen, more and more good players could fall down to that 21st pick because you have players that are unexpectedly uh, selected much earlier. Pass rushers, again, I think there's going to be a good pass rusher there. As I've reported at Skeeter, Dallas Turner is basically considered the consensus number one pass rusher. Then you have Jared Verse, you have Latu, and you have Chop Robinson. But it's not universal in that order. There are some people that have Jared Verse as their number two pass rusher after Dallas Turner. There are some that have him number four after Dallas Turner. Latu is liked in a lot of areas, but he also has a neck injury, which is, has concerned some uh, teams. Chop Robinson, a lot of people love his upside, love his character, love the person. They say he's got short arms. I don't think that's a big deal. Hasn't had much production, but he did have a uh, a significant concussion in, uh, last year in the Ohio State game. Only played eight games last year. I happen to love Chuck Robinson. So it depends on what they think. I, I mean, I, I've heard pass rusher. I said offensive line. But I've heard Miami at 21 would prefer to trade down, get extra selections, and then take a player uh, later later part of round one. Now, now, you have said all along, and no more. Don't, don't even try. Don't even try. It. You, you were like, no, I want to stay at twenty-one. Don't even try it. Whatever. You come on. Don't, don't be like that. Try. I have never wanted to stay at twenty-one. I, I started to cons reconsider myself when you wrote your little story and 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 pissed all over what I thought I could get for pick number twenty-one. But let, let's talk about these offensive tackles. This is supposedly a historic offensive tackle draft. Which guys do you think fit a zone scheme like the Miami Dolphins run? And which guys do you think can spend the first year at guard? Those two factors. Give me the names, Tony. Well, the top name, if you're talking the bottom half of round one, the bottom third of round one, the guy that sticks out would be Jordan Morgan. And in my opinion, that would be the guy that if they trade down, that they would target. Jordan Morgan of Arizona, who was a terrific left tackle at Arizona. Slightly undersized, mobile, athletic. You can start him at guard and then eventually develop him into a left tackle. I think he's got great upside. He's got to get stronger. He's got to improve some areas of his game. But that would be the player that I would focus on if Miami decides to trade down the bottom part of round one. And I agree that I've been told what they're looking at is for an interior guy now that could eventually be a left tackle. That would be one guy. The other guy who I had in my mock draft, it is uh, Fatanu of uh, Washington if he falls that far. And he may because there are some medical co concerns depending on the team. Fatanu played left tackle at Washington. Big, mobile guy. Terrific pass protector. You'll watch him move. He gets out on the second and third level. Takes on linebackers and defensive backs. Removes them from the action. Sort of a Broderick Jones type of ability. His ability blocking emotion. Great lateral range. Great footwork off the edge and pass protection. There's some knee, knee issues which some teams may will be concerned about. has to be looked at. He's also 6'3 and a half. You have to get over the fact that are you happy or are you okay with your left tackle being 6'3 and a half? If you are, Fatano, if he's there at 21, and that's who I had Miami selecting at 21, is that type of guy that comes in, can come in, 
in 2024, play guard, and then eventually you groom him to move out to left tackle. Why Fatano over Graham Brent by, uh, by uh, Barton? I don't think Graham Barton's going to be there. I think that Pittsburgh could take him. I do think that if Graham Barton is there, I think that that is a, a player that Miami would consider taking at 21. There's no doubt in my mind that that happens. Barton is a guy who I, I think that Fatano is a better pure left tackle than Graham Barton. Graham Barton was good. Fatano was exceptional, in, in my opinion. Uh, now, Barton is a projection at center, just like Fatano is a projection at guard. But I think it's easy, easier to move from guard, uh, from uh, tackle to guard than it is from tackle to center. I also think that Fatano, in my opinion, has less downside as a left tackle than Graham Barton uh, on Sunday than Graham Barton does at left tackle. He's a little bit smaller. He's very athletic. They're, they're similar in a sense that, and even you could throw Jordan Morgan in this mix as well as they're not dominant run blockers. They're not. They're guys that have to get stronger and improve their run blocking strength for Sunday, which is something that's very coachable. It's tough to coach athleticism. You, it's tough to coach agility, mobility. That's what these guys have. Easier to get them in the weight room, add some bulk to their frame, and get them stronger. Give, give me the give me the day one best guard there out of that group. Well, uh, again, these are there is no pure guard that is a first round pick. They're tackles who are you are projecting to guard. Mention Fatano, mention Graham Barton, who projects to guard or even center. Fuega of Oregon State is also projected to guard uh, by a lot of teams. Fuega is the, the right tackle from Oregon State. You know the New York Jets like him a lot. Some teams think that he can be pushed into guard and then eventually moved out to right tackle. There are no true first-round guards. I mean, you, you have to go into day two when you're looking at guys like Christian Haynes uh, of UConn, Cooper Beebe of Kansas State, Isaiah Adams of uh, Illinois, and then the wild card, in my opinion, would be Zach Zinter of Michigan, who should be a day two pick. Probably, if he was healthy, is a top 40 choice. Dominant guard at Michigan, moves very well, broke his leg in that Ohio State game. So it was an injury late in the season. You know, it depends on when team doctors feel he'll be back in 100% ready. One interior offensive lineman who was linked to the Dolphins for a while was Jackson Powers Johnson. Where do you stand on him? I like Jackson Powers Johnson a lot. He is still the number one rated center on my board. I thought for the longest time that would be the pick for the Miami Dolphins. What happened with Jackson Powers Johnson was the more I look, talk to people in the league, and what happens is when you do mock drafts, your first couple of mock drafts is what you think will happen, what you think should happen. And then as you get closer to the draft, you start talking to more and more people, and you start to get an idea of what will happen, which is so oftentimes completely different to what you think should happen. And that's what happened with Jackson Powers Johnson. Some people told me he's got a personality that rubs people the wrong way. I don't necessarily agree with that, but that is an opinion out there. There was somebody, and I reported this, that told me that, you know, he was overrated from the beginning. He never should have been rated as a first-round choice. I disagree with that. I still have a first-round grade on him. I think he's going to go in the first round. And the more and more I delved into this, the more and more it seemed like, Miami wasn't very interested in Jackson Powers Johnson, which surprised me. So I talked to people in the league. I talked to people who knew, uh, who were familiar with the, with the Dolphins franchise. I finally reached out to his agent. And if you look at the SRA, there were two agents listed uh, as, as his representation. I know both of them. One of them I've known for about 15, 17 years now, and we're very good friends. We talk throughout the year, not just about football. And he seemed kind of cool. To the fact that the Dolphins would take Jackson Powers Johnson. He really didn't think that that was going to happen. And he also mentioned to me that Jackson Powers Johnson uh, never made a trip to see the uh, Miami Dolphins. He said that there was information out there that Powers Johnson had visited the Dolphins. And he said it was false, that the report was not true. I had reported it. And Barry Jackson, who I knew and uh, I've had a good uh, relationship with Barry Jackson. I haven't heard from him in a while said that my report was unequivocally false and that Jackson Powers Johnson did in fact visit Miami. So yesterday I reached back out to his agent, who I've known for almost two decades now, and I said, you know, did I hear something wrong? I mean, as we say, as Italian said, did I go stunad? Did I hear you wrong? 
I said, he said, no, Jackson Powers Johnson never visited the Miami Dolphins. When I was on the phone with him, he pulled up Jackson Powers visits. He pulled up the list and says, you know, he, 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 he wasn't there. The report is, is incorrect. So either the, either uh, Jackson Powers Johnson didn't visit the uh, Miami Dolphins or he made a secret visit to them and the agent doesn't know about it. The bottom line is this. I don't get the feeling that everything I've, heard, I've been told is that uh, uh, f- f- people have been telling me is that Jackson Powers Johnson is not going to be the Dolphins pick at 21. Why, why is he sliding, in your opinion? Well, I, I think I just told you. I mean, you know, the interviews, some of the interviews have not gone well. And somebody said he never really should have been a first-round pick or he was overrated to begin with. Again, it's not an opinion I agree with because he was a terrific right guard at Oregon in 2022. He did a real good job at center this year. He went to the senior bowl. He was injured. He was dominant the one day of practice. But, but you know, what happens is, is you know, when, you, when you're scouting players, when it comes to the draft, you're not going to get 32 uh, opinions that are parallel. <laughs> they're, you know, you, they're going to be all over the place. Same thing with medicals. You know, we talked about Latu before. The medicals on Latu were all over the place. Uh, it, you know, I, I think that – or this, what I was told was that he was overrated on the outside to begin with, you know – Talk about J.J. McCarthy. It's just the opposite with J.J. McCarthy, where most people on the outside say late first round pick and uh, people in the league absolutely teams absolutely love J.J. McCarthy, which is why he's going to be a a top six, top uh, five pick tonight. Um, Pick McCarthy. Oh, somebody's going to try to get him. I mean, Minnesota Vikings made that made those moves in the offseason to get the extra first round pick because they need a quarterback. So the quarterbacks go one, two, three. It's a matter of uh, who wants to trade with Minnesota for that fourth quarterback. Right. It could be Arizona, it could be the Chargers, uh, either one of those two. Uh, there was some some word earlier this week out that the Dolphins, quote unquote, are in, very interested or very intrigued by Xavier Worthy. Uh, are we buying this, or is it a smoke screen to throw off the scent, so to speak? Oh, well, I, I think he he's a perfect fit for their system. I mean, he is a downfield threat. He's a field stretcher. You know, he's going to take the top off of that defense more so than the players they already have there. Uh, are, are they interested in him? Yes. I don't know that they would take him. I don't even know that he's going to be there because the, the word is, is that the Indianapolis Colts, if they can't trade up to get uh, Brock Bowers, a tight end, they could take him with the 15th pick, you know, with their young developing quarterback, Anthony Richardson, who could throw the ball a country mile with ease. W- what better weapon to give him than a guy like Xavier Worthy who ran a 4-2-1 at the combine, but more importantly, plays to that speed on the football field. So let me ask you this question, Tony. Why Xavier Worthy over Brian Thomas Jr.? Or do you have it flipped? I have Brian Thomas Jr. on my board rated higher than Xavier Worthy. I think that Xavier Worthy is a smaller, one-dimensional type of receiver. But you don't get guys who... Run four, run four, two, one every day, and play to that speed. And Ryan Thomas has been really productive just for one season. If I was building the team, I would take Ryan Thomas. But you know, they're looking Why? for weapons. Why? Why? I'm sorry. Why? Well, because he, because he's bigger, he's stouter, he's got longer arms, he's more consistent catching the football. He didn't run a four, two, one, Brian Thomas, but he ran a four, three, three, which is probably close to two tenths faster than anyone thought he was going to run at the combine. So it's just a matter of coaching him to, you know, uh, uh, play to that speed, play to that 4-3-3 speed. And he may not be the downfield threat that Xavier Worthy is, but he's still a legitimate long threat. And if you want a guy on third down or in the red zone or a guy to go over the middle and make the difficult catch, do you want Brian Thomas or do you want Xavier Worthy? You're going to go with Brian Thomas 99 times out of 100. And I like the bigger, stouter receivers. Uh, interesting name here. Been thrown out in connection with the Dolphins at one point. It's Cooper DeJean. Mm. Possible at all, he could be used in a Kyle Hamilton Kyle type of role if the Dolphins get their hands on him. I think 21 is early, but I would agree with you. I, I mean, Kyle Hamilton is an excellent uh, comparison. Uh, I've always had my questions about Cooper DeJean being a cornerback in the NFL. There are some teams that are now moving him to their safety board. He's a very athletic player, a very athletic uh, prospect. 
he was more, in my opinion, more an opportunistic defensive back than a polished defensive back that had outstanding ball skills. I like, like say, Kool-Aid McKinnistry, uh, Quinion Mitchell. Those guys have got really good ball skills. Uh, Cooper DeGene is a guy who's more opportunistic. Played facing the action and zone, which, uh, you know, sometimes a transition to bump and run cover where you got to make plays with your back to the ball can be a very difficult, if not impossible one. But I think, yeah, if, if you are going to use him in that sort of role, then, you know, you have to consider him. 21 is a little bit early for my case, as far as Cooper DeGene is concerned. I consider him more a late first, early second round pick, but teams will look at his size. They'll look at his athleticism. They look at his upside and they say, we're going to coach the best out of him and we're going to turn this, this cat into a dominant defensive back. I'm going to stick with defensive backs because I, I, I need to get you on the, on the take about Cam Kitchens, who I believe is, in my opinion, yeah, one of the top safeties in this draft. My I, God. I, I like what I like, man. man. And, and, and I also want your evaluation on some of these UM offensive linemen and defensive linemen in this draft just to feed the Hurricane fans. Uh, where do you think Kitchen goes, and 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 also, what's your opinion on on uh, Cohen and and uh, Lee? Um, Kitchens is a terrific safety. Uh, I mean, I, I, I when I watched the when I watched the film, I thought he was a real good traditional center fielder. Good ball skills, good instincts, good head. His pre-draft testing killed him. I mean, I know he ran, he ran like a four six five at the combine. He was a little bit better at the pro day, although if you look at the APT sheets, he was still in the high four five fives. Doesn't mean he can't play on Sunday. It just means he's not going to be an early pick, you know, over the next three days. I think what's going to happen is you're looking at a day three uh, prospect who, you know, may need to play in a system that protects him because of the lack of speed. There's no doubt in my mind that Camp Kitchens is going to be an NFL safety. I just don't think he's going to be a high pick. And you can say that for the entire safety class. I mean, this is not a good safety class. Your safeties are not going to start to come off the board until late in round two, round three. And while a lot of people think Jaden Hicks of Washington State's the top safety, you really don't know. So I think Cam Kitchens, really good player, average athlete, could be a real good player on, on Sunday uh, in the right system. Matthew Lee, I mean, I've watched him, and I've got notes on him going back to his days in Central Florida. Matthew Lee is like Cam Kitchens in the sense that he's not the biggest guy in the world. He's not the strongest guy in the world, but he's tough. He's smart. He's fundamentally sound, uh, was terrific during Shrine Bowl practice. Uh, I, I think the step of moving from Central Florida uh, to Miami was to his benefit. He's a solid zone-blocking guy. He's got to get bigger if he can, if he's got that growth potential. Uh, I don't know what kind of upside he has. He's a very late round pick. But when you're looking at a center, you know, you want guys that are smart, guys that are alert, guys that are tough, players that have, know how to work with their line mates. That's Matthew Lee. And that's why he's a late round pick who I think at the very least makes an NFL roster as a backup. Cohen is – he's a zone-blocking lineman. I've seen him all over boards. I have him as a fourth-rounder. I thought at certain points he could be a second-rounder. Uh, I'm sorry, he's a power-gap guy. That's his own block. He's a power-gap guy, big, thick NFL uh, – big, thick bottom, NFL build, punching him out type of guy, terrific uh, pass – uh, terrific run blocker who's good in pass protection. But unlike Matthew, uh, Matthew Lee, unlike some of the other linemen you talked about in that zone-blocking system, Cone's best playing in a phone booth, best playing in a small area. Um, and then to finish off my hurricane coverage, uh, Leonard Taylor, the yeah. third, um, where do you see him going and, and what kind of NFL player do you project him to be? Interesting about Leonard Taylor is uh, he's very explosive. He's more of your one gap type of lineman, which means, you know, he's going to either be in a four man line where you're lining him up uh, against one offensive lineman because he's not big. He's not powerful. He moves very well. Interesting story about Leonard Taylor. Uh, I was interviewing, uh, he was interviewed by a team. I was privy to the interview at the Shrine Bowl practices and he came across as a nice guy, very articulate, but he talked about spread. He wants to spread peace and love 
you know, while he's on you know, face the earth. And that's a wonderful thing. But NFL teams don't want to hear that from a defensive lineman. Right no. or wrong, they don't want to hear it from a defensive lineman. They want a defensive lineman that says, I'm going to tear your head off. And, and I spoke about this with somebody. And he said, you know, in these interviews, he's got to come across as a little bit meaner. I like Leonard Taylor. I think he's going to be a uh, day three pick. I think he's got a lot of upside. Even though he says he wants to spread peace and love around the world, he really doesn't play like that. He plays like he wants to attack the opponent and, and really finish off play. So to his credit, uh, he's got to get a little bit bigger or he's got to get a little bit stronger. Uh, but I think he'll be a viable rotational lineman on Sunday. I don't know how to move on from spreading love around the world. That was, that was beautiful. Uh, in your latest mock draft, you had Troy Franklin, the wide receiver, going to the Dolphins in round two. What was the rationale behind that pick? Well, yeah, I mean, you asked me about Xavier Worthy. Uh, I think Xavier Worthy to the Dolphins in round one is more of a luxury pick. I think with Troy Franklin, you get a speed guy who's a good vertical receiver, not super fast, but he plays fast. I think he ran a 4-4-1 at the combine, but he plays much faster. He's got excellent length. He's also a real good uh, route runner who knows how to separate. Consistent pass catcher. Has not had a great pre-draft process in the, in the sense that he hasn't tested incredibly well. But you watch the film. And he's a good receiver. And the fact is, I think he's going to get washed up in the in – the, because of the fact that there are so many receivers in this draft, excuse me, and when you get to the bottom part of round two, I think he's great value. And again, if they go pass rusher in round one, if they go offensive lineman in round one, it's just another weapon, and he's a good fit for that system. And he yeah, bit, isn't, he, more, isn't he a little bit light? He's, he's, he's tall and thin right now, uh, which is fine. He's a good route runner, but he's also a young guy who I think as he physically matures – We'll just add bulk to his frame. Real good pass catcher. I mean, the film on Franklin, and I came into the process kind of kind of more cold than hot on Franklin. But when I watched the film, I was like, you know, this guy is much better than I initially gave him credit for. All right, Tony. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot for day three gems. I'm gonna name the position. You give me your day three gem that people are sleeping on. Quarterback. Uh, quarterback, uh, Michael Pratt's a little bit one dimensional. I'm going to say Joe Milton of Tennessee in, in the late round, just because of the physical skills. I mean, he's got a massive, massive arm. He can make all the passes, six, three, 235 pounds, incredibly athletic, but he needs work from the ground up. If you get Joe Milton hooked up with a real good quarterback coach, you give him time because he's going to need time. You could have something down the road. Day three gem and wide receiver. Wide receiver. Let me look at my board here. I'm going to say I like Brendan Rice of USC. Well, you okay. know, chip off the old block. I mean, a guy who's very consistent, underrated, terrific route runner, knows how to separate, was a, one, of, one of Caleb Williams' favorite targets. Not a true downfield threat, but like his dad, just does everything very well. And because he didn't test off the charts and there are so many receivers in the draft, he's going to fall into day three. Day three, offensive lineman. I mentioned Zach uh, Zinter of Michigan. If he, this guard, for, the guard who, who broke his leg, if he falls into day three, that would be my guy. Otherwise, I'm going to say Matt Gunkalvis of Pittsburgh, a left tackle who's mobile, he's athletic, terrific footwork. Had toe surgery the second uh, after the second game of the season, missed the entire season, entered the draft anyway, uh, did not work out the combine, had a decent but not great uh, pro day workout. But you watch the film and you see a guy who blocks with solid fundamentals, real good footwork and pass protection. Some people project him the guard. I think he can fit his own blocking system. I think he's got the size to grow into a power gap blocker. Day three, edge player. <laughs> I'm going to say, I'll give you, uh, I'll go with J uh, Javon Solomon of Troy, a guy who's not really big, six one and a half, goes about 240 pounds, but he's just a fierce, in-your-face, tough edge rusher who's made a ton of plays behind the line of scrimmage of uh, the past two seasons. It is not, he's not 40 fast. But he's football fast. He's quick up the field. He can bend off the edge. But he plays smart and tough. I mean, he'll defend the run. 
You can use him off the line in space. He's going to be selected somewhere in day three because of the size and the speed. But I think he's going to be a real good 3-4 situational pass rusher on Sunday. And you mean your day three interior player? Interior lineman, um, I'm going to say I, Rook Aroru, I, I think he's going to go in the third round. Uh, looking at my hair, uh, Jaden Crumity of uh, Mississippi State played nose tackle for New Mississippi State. He's got decent size. He's not your traditional 330-pound nose tackle. He's more in, in the area, about 310 pounds. But he's quick. He's mobile. You can use him in a four-man line. You can use him in a three-man line if you want to put him at defensive end. He's probably going to go somewhere in the sixth round. Now, interior linebacker, which I, I don't hear much about that position in this draft. I'm assuming nobody likes them. Well, nobody likes – and nobody likes any linebackers that can't rush the passer anymore. I, I mean, it, it's kind of sad. The off-the-ball linebacker has kind of fallen. Um, day three interior linebacker, I like Jaden Ford of Texas, who could play on the inside of a 3-4. He can also play on the outside in a 4-3. He's tough. He's your typical long-horn linebacker. Run to the ball, attack the opponent, but also smart, instinctive, and plays within the system. Did have recently have hernia surgery, so there's some question as to when he'll be ready, but I think he's got a lot of upside. Okay, and what about your cornerback position? Day, day three, cornerback or safety? Day three, cornerback or safety? Jerry's Monroe is not going to get drafted because he ran so horribly. Um, looking at my list right here, I'm going to go with Carlton Johnson of Fresno State. A tall, thin guy, ran 4-2-7 during his pro day, but he's a tough, instinctive corner with good ball skills. He shows the ability to play in man coverage. He shows the ability to play in zone or backed off the line of scrimmage. He plays to his 4 2 one speed. He's a tall, thinner guy who's just going to have to get a little bit bigger, which should come as he's physically matured. Unlike Cooper DeGene, Carlton Johnson's got polished ball skills. He knows how to make plays when the ball's in the air. It's not just opportunistic, but he's going to fall because he's a tall, thin guy. <coughs> Excuse me. People don't know if he's an outside guy, if he's an inside guy. He's just a real good cornerback. Any special say, teamers? Hold on, hold on. Amai. Did you say 4 2 1? Did I hear that? 4 2 7. 4 2 7. Okay. Uh, and Omar Omar did not mention running back or tight end. How dare you, Omar? Any running back or tight end worth mentioning for day three? Tight ends, I'm going to go with Eric All of Iowa, who's going to be a six-round pick. Eric All has been rated the past two years as a day two pick by NFL scouts. Was it Michigan in 2022? I think he missed most of the season with a back injury. Played seven games for Iowa this year. When he was on the field, he was terrific. I mean, a big guy, 260 pounds, who is a mobile 260-pound type of tight end that can get down the field and catch the ball. Had an, a significant knee injury. I believe it was seven games into the season. <clears throat> so he's coming into the draft labeled as injury prone since he spent more time on the sidelines than he has on the football field the past two years. But when you watch the film, it's outstanding. And it's maybe just a matter of, getting this guy into the proper weight training program and getting him back to full health. Once he stays on the field, you're going to have a real good tight end. As far as running backs, uh, I'm going to go with Dylan Lauby, Lob of uh, New Hampshire in the late rounds, sixth, maybe seventh round. Smaller guy, tough interior runner, who was a sensational pass catcher on the backfield, who also was very effective as a return specialist at New Hampshire. And with the kickoff rules being changed this year, now all of a sudden, you know, your return specialists, there's more emphasis on them because you're not going to see, you know, uh, opponents just kick the ball through the end zone. You said tough physical runner. Any Derrick Henry's in this draft class? Any Derrick Henry's in this draft class. As far as if you're looking at day three, look at uh, Kamani Vidal of Troy, about 215 pounds. He's a shorter guy, not even five foot uh, nine, but he's a tough downhill runner. Tested much better than people thought at the combine. Also a good pass catcher on the backfield, which obviously as the game has evolved, if you're if you're a ball carrier, if you're a running back, you got to be able to catch the ball out of the backfield. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, me about specialists. I got I got to get this one guy in, Tory Taylor of Iowa, yeah. early fourth potential, late third round pick. If you watched Iowa, I mentioned Eric Wall this, uh, previously, the tight end. Iowa's offense was awful this year. I mean, they were they were abysmal. And this guy, he's 26 years old. He's from Australia, played Australian rules football. This guy can kick the 
crap out of the ball. I, I mean, it's one of those things where when he kicks the ball, you get dizzy because you look up in the sky so long. But he's also a good directional kicker. He's not just a, a big-legged guy that flips the field, which he does with regularity. If you need him to kick the ball out to the hashes, out to the cones, he does that well. It wouldn't surprise me if Troy Taylor ends up as a third round, late, late part of third round on Friday night. So, so is there a better prospect saying, than Punt God? Than who? Punt God. God. I get, I'm Punt sorry, God? say it again. Is he a better prospect than Punt God two years ago, Matt Ariza? Uh, well, Ryzer went in the fifth round. Uh, I, I think it, he's only better because of the fact that he played in the Big Ten and the Iowa offense was so bad, worse than the San Diego State offense that Ariza uh, played under, uh, that you know, he was constantly on the field trying to kick Iowa out, out, of, uh, out of trouble. I'll tell you this. They probably have, if I go back and look at Ariza's grade compared to Taylor's grade, they're probably right there because I had Ariza selected as a potential late third rounder that year. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Tony, we always appreciate it. Got, what, what's your one bold predict, prediction about the first round of this draft? Uh, I, I'm not going to hit 32 out of 32 on my mock draft. That, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's really yeah. bold. <laughs> that, 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 that's it. I, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, there's a couple of things. I think, uh, you know, we're, we're going to see uh, potential trades, maybe the Colts moving up for Brock Bowers, the Eagles and the Steelers potentially trying to move up to Denver's pick for uh, one of the cornerbacks, Quinnon Mitchell, Terry and Arnold, Denver, who wants to move back because, you know, it's not – I don't know how you take Bo Nix with the 12th pick of the draft. He's not worth the 12th pick of the draft. And they, they they need a quarterback. Uh, we may see more trades than people are initially projecting as we uh, move towards uh, eight o'clock tonight. So let me ask you this: any any if you think the Dolphins could possibly move up to twelve, who would you think would be the target that motivates them? Wow, um, you got to think it would. You got if that would happen, I would think it would be a guy like Fawega, the offensive lineman. If you're looking at uh, top offensive lineman that could start off at guard and move to tackle, the only thing is, is I don't know that Fawega is anything other than a right tackle. So if you, it, you know, if you do that, it's probably for somebody like that because he is highly rated. I, I, I can't see that moving up for Fatanu. Maybe I'm wrong, um, but I think it would be for an offensive lineman. Unless somehow they're absolutely in love with Jared Verse and, and they think that Jared Verse isn't going to fall down to them and uh, and they're willing to give away the draft capital to move up and get him. Definitely. Well, Tony, we appreciate your time. Tell the people where they can find your work on draft weekend. I'll be on Sports Skeeta. All the reports are there. we got the mock draft simulator. I will be tweeting occasionally. I, I will have the picks before they are, they are announced on the network, although I will not be tweeting the picks out because I know people don't like that. If there are trades, I'll probably I'll tweet the trades out, but uh, I'll be around. All right, definitely. I always appreciate your time, Tony. You you Tony. know you you know you've been my guy for two decades, and we will talk to you again. All right. Good luck. Good luck. Enjoy the draft. Good luck to the Dolphins this weekend. All right, thanks, Tony. Thanks.